Hello everyone. In this video, I will show the plot of the game Tactics Ogre, Let Us Cling Together. This game is the direct sequel to Ogre Battle, The March of the Black Queen, and takes place in the same time period as Ogre Battle 64, Person of Lordly Caliber. A lot is officially vague and left to interpretation, so I made the script more simplified and chronologically for understanding. There is currently no new game that continues the story after this one, so there is no way to say so far which is the correct path. In this video, I will be using information from the Lawful Root and the Princess Ending. If you like the Ogre Battle Saga, subscribe to the channel and like the video for YouTube to show this amazing universe to more people around the world. Ready? Let's go! At the beginning of everything, the creation. According to legends, in the beginning a superior god created all things. He became known as Great Father Philaha and created various races, environments, climates and three main realms. The realm of the heavens, where Philaha and her sacred servants would live like angels and lesser gods, such as the elemental goddesses. Below them would live some creatures and humans, preferred creation and made in the likeness of the superior god in the earth realm. And finally, below them, the underworld, a land inhabited by chaotic and very powerful creatures like ogres and also home to evil gods. What would allow the connection and movement between these three realms would be the so-called Chaos Gates, magical portals distributed around the realms. In this scenario, humans thrived across the land, developing and creating kingdoms. All was going well until at one point, Demunza, the god of the underworld and darkness, decides to send 108 legions of ogres to the surface through the chaos gates in order to rule the land for himself. His army of monsters and demons was far more powerful than humans, equaling even the gods due to the help of the dark powers and the innate violence of the species. This gave even more advantage to the cursed army, which advanced through the regions easily, destroying everything and everyone. One of the races that fought alongside the ogres are called Dragon Lords, powerful creatures that used draconic magic and were holders of a lot of knowledge. They left their knowledge in ruins and preferred to settle near Chaos Gates to steady its power. Deadless was one of these dragon lords who built a huge shrine in honor of Asmodee, one of the evil gods of the underworld. This shrine was located on an island to the south called Valyria, above a chaos gate and was called the Palace of the Dead, as it lured bitter spirits into the abyss. The extinction of humans and domination by the underworld was a matter of time. But to protect humans, the gods above decide to intervene. In the last battle for the human race, an army of angels is sent from the heavens to the battlefield, along with three legendary knights from ages past and twelve mighty sages with divine powers. Furthermore, one of the lesser gods identified on a continent far south of the battlefield some exceptional humans called Balmakins. Admired by their strength and ferocity in battle, this god used their powers to bring them to the battlefield as reinforcements against the ogres. And so would begin the war of the last humans and divine beings against the legions of ogres. This event became known as the Ogre Battle.
After long and difficult battles, humans allied to the powers of divine armies managed to defeat a large number of monsters, sending them back to the underworld and sealing the chaos gates to prevent further invasions. However, a seer had made a premonition that another ogre battle would occur sometime in the future. With that in mind, before returning to the skies again, one of the legendary knights who helped in the battle leaves the humans with his sword called Brynhild, which is capable of breaking any seal. So, when the time comes, humans could use it to reopen a chaos gate and again call for help from the heavens for the ultimate battle. With the threat of the ogres defeated, humans could now develop and expand to various parts of the world again. Many years later, Dorgalua's Great War. A lot of time passes and humans know prosperity, creating multiple kingdoms around the world again. Our focus here will be on the Valyrian Isles, a strategic and commercial point, which due to this ends up being frequently attacked by pirates and barbarians who dispute control of the region with the inhabitants. The island is home to three distinct ethnic groups that ended up being organized into five main kingdoms. The Bakram are the lineage of nobles, aristocrats, and religious, living to the north of the island in the kingdom of Fittic and kingdom of Barnisha. In these regions is the Order of Philaha, an organization that worships the great father Philaha, his elemental daughters, and his heavenly servants. This religion is widespread throughout the island and therefore had a lot of influence. The Galgastani, the majority of the population, making up 70% of all people on the island, lay to the south in the kingdom of Brigantes and kingdom of Coritania. Also to the south were the Wallisters, the minority who were discriminated against by the Bakram and the Galgastani, and occupied the kingdom of Almorica. The kingdom of Brigantes was ruled by King Roger Dismoria. The kingdom of Coritania commanded by Count Orlando. The kingdom of Fittuk ruled by King Rianica. The kingdom of Barnisha commanded by Lord Clement and the kingdom of Almorica was commanded probably by some duke of the region. These kingdoms lived in disputes seeking to expand their domains, but they were always small and punctual conflicts. Brigantes, however, secretly financed rebels in Barnisha to overthrow and destabilize the kingdom. The leader of these rebels was called Dorgalua Abarith. Everything changed when these rebels against Lord Clement of Barnisha tried to stage a coup to seize power. The coup is foiled, but Lord Clement is killed in the process. King Ramonica of Fittuk hears about the Lord's death and decides to take advantage of the chaos that has been raging in the kingdom to start his domination project. The King of Fittuk then declares war on the kingdoms of Barnisha and Almorica and begins his attack. Not satisfied with attacking just the two of them and wanting the island all to himself, King Ramonica orders his troops to invade the kingdom of Coritania as well, where they manage to kill Count Orlando. With Orlando dead and seeing Fittica's advance and imminent threat, King Roderick of Brigantes takes control of the region of Coritania and leads Coritania and her kingdom of Brigantes, now united as one, to enter the war against King Ramonica. Dorgalua and his rebels also sense the threat and team up with Roderick to defeat Ramonica. The two powerful battlefronts manage to advance against Fittica's armies and reach King Ramonica, ending him and his bloodthirsty war. 
To avoid more massive conflicts like this and more deaths, Roderick and Dorgalua decide to make a non-aggression agreement between them. This attitude brought only a few months of peace to the island, as both felt harmed by the terms of the agreement. And again, the plains of Valeria were stained with blood as the two armies collided for what felt like eternity. Desperate with the never-ending battle, King Roger Dismoria decides to perform an act of insanity. He uses the secret knowledge hidden in his kingdom and passed down from generation to generation to summon the ultimate forbidden spell, the Apocrypha. The invocation makes the whole earth tremble, rocks break loose towards the abyss and hellfire. Furious winds cut the soldiers as they passed, agitated rays ran across the battlefield, burning everything and everyone along with fireballs hotter than the sun itself. The absolute ice hit the soldiers' armor. Beams of light coming directly from the sky hit people, evaporating them, and those who tried to flee were swallowed by abyssal spirits summoned from the darkness itself. Roderick had made the ultimate sacrifice. The powerful effects of the magic destroyed a large chunk of Dorgalua's army, but along with them also several soldiers from Roderick's own army, and even civilians in nearby villages, were obliterated along the way. Such an attitude turned Roderick's army against the king himself, and this internal instability was enough for Dorgalua to advance and win the war. Roderick was arrested and died in his cell in agony. His bitter soul was drawn to the palace of the dead on the island and sealed away in the abyss by the chaos gate there. The war had come to an end. Dorgalua makes alliances and encourages the miscegenation of the nation, unifying all the island kingdoms under one. From now on he would be known as the Dynast King of the Kingdom of Valyria, the one who fought the war to end all wars, bringing peace and unity to Bakrams, Galgastanis, and Wallisters. While these events were taking place on the islands, in the western region of the continent of Galius, the Holy Lodician Empire was born. This empire was based on the religious dogma of Lodicism, which preached that there was only one supreme god, named Filler, and that any other supposed gods worshipped in other religions around the world would be nothing more than avatars of Filler. So the worship of these avatars is blasphemous and should be fought. Only true faith should exist. Initially, this dogma was restricted only to the region where the empire was located. But it didn't take long for the king to decide to expand this doctrine to other people and gain more power. This campaign would become known as the Holy War and was initially supported by the clergy as a way of expanding the religion and by nobles and merchants as a way of acquiring wealth. Later, the participating knightly orders themselves began to support it as a form of ordeal of pride and honor. Lodi's army was made up of 16 legions of mighty knights. With the strength of his armies, Lodi's commits his crusades to the nearby regions in order to force the conversion to his religion and also exercising dominion and control, either directly, as if they were his colonies, or indirectly, giving certain autonomy to those who surrender but controlling the most important decisions of the kingdoms. The empire was controlled by a king, but Pope Sardian makes a violent coup d'etat together with the Senate and becomes the supreme ruler of the empire, ordering beyond the domination of lands, the search for magical and mythological artifacts to further expand his power and influence. Southeast of the continent of Galius was the continent of Zydegenia. 
To defend against a possible invasion of Lodis, the sacred Zydegenian Empire is formed, led by Empress Endora and Sage Rashidi. Rashidi ends up coming into contact with magic from the abyss and corrupting the entire kingdom with darkness and leading the entire population to oppression. The history of this region is told in detail in the game The March of the Black Queen. I will leave the video above for you to watch. The sacred Zydegenian Empire has been in place for approximately 25 years, and in between that time, an event involving some angels occurs on Ovis, an island located northwest of Galius. This event is detailed in the game The Night of Lodis, which I'll also leave on the card above for you to follow along. This event ends up leading a knight to meet the Pope and present him with a divine relic. As a reward, Sardian renames the knight to Lancelot Tartarus and makes him leader of one of the 16 legions, called the Dark Knights La Slorian, the strongest among the 16, formed by a few elite knights, to carry out secret missions such as espionage and assassinations, being the right arm and private security of the Pope himself. The Dark Knights are respected in Lodis as well as feared in other regions. Afraid that all this trust the Pope had placed in Tartarus and the Dark Knights could lead to a coup by them to come to power, Vogers v. Roms, a man of great influence in Lodis and commander of several orders of knights, decides to infiltrate his two sons, Hogarim v. Roms and Balxaphon v. Roms, in the group to spy. Tartarus, as a very manipulative man, discovers the plan and Balxaphon ends up being swayed to change sides. When Vogers refuses to support the Lothlorien, Balxaphon kills his father and accuses his brother of the murder. Hogarim has his eyes gouged out and he is exiled from Lodis as punishment, swearing revenge on his brother for the event. After a few years, the sacred Zydegenian Empire is defeated, and Dora and Rashidi are killed by the Liberation Army under the command of Destin Faroda and Prince Tristan Zenobia. Tristan becomes king and in place of the Empire creates the Kingdom of New Zenobia. Upon learning of Lodi's advances, Destin and four other rebellion warriors head north to investigate, arriving at a kingdom called Palatinus that had already been invaded by Lodis. This adventure is told in the game Ogre Battle 64, Person of Lordly Caliber, which I'll leave on a card above for you to see later. Back to the Valyrian Islands. To commemorate his victory in the Unified Kingdom, King Dorgalua orders the construction of the Hanging Gardens, a huge tower in the middle of the desert with more vegetation at each floor, as a gesture of love to his wife, Vernada Eltina Aberith. The construction site was a Dragon Lord's Ruin, and also a Chaos Gate. Dorgalua spent a lot of time in these gardens drinking, celebrating with the soldiers, and also accompanied by women. And it was in one of these moments that he had an affair with the most faithful servant of Queen Vernada, named Manaflora Bafanda. This relationship ended in Manaflora's pregnancy, which was discovered by the queen near the time of birth. The queen was furious and ordered her servant to leave. Manaflora leaves alone on a rainy night, but is discovered by Brenton Morn and her brother, Prancet Morn. Both were bishops of the order of Philaha and helped her to give birth. Manaflora names the child Versalia Aberith and then dies. 
Renton tells Prancet to raise the child as his own and keep the secret from the king. Prancet had recently lost his daughter named Cashua, so he would raise this child as if she were Cashua. Brenton is a character who seeks power at any cost, so he uses this information of this child's existence to blackmail Queen Vernada. With this, he is placed in a prestigious position within the Order of Philahab by the Queen's influence. Prancet Morn takes care of Cashua, and three years later he has a son with his wife. The child is called Dana Morn. Prancet was also a close friend of Arcurius Muvafoina, the top rank of the Order of Philaha. Muva had four daughters, named Seria, Sherry, Sistina, and Olivia. The six children always played together outside the sanctuary while their parents attended to the Order's obligations. King Dorgalua receives the scrolls containing the apocrypha spells used by Roderick in the war and orders Muva to seal them away so they will never be used again. Muva seals the powerful spells in specific temples around the island with the help of his four daughters, who would act as seal keys if one day someone worthy of having such power arises. Much later, Queen Vernada becomes pregnant by King Dorgalua, who was very old. The prince is born, the official heir to the throne of Valeria, to the relief of the entire population of the island. The queen had lied to the king that her servant had died in an accident, so Dorgalua was unaware of her daughter's existence. One day, as a child, the prince was playing in the hanging gardens and ended up falling from one of the floors. His parents find the child lifeless and are devastated. A few days pass and Queen Vernada also passes away due to the anguish of her son's death. King Dorgalua begs the heavens for his family to be reincarnated, but his request is not granted. If the light did not answer him, enraged, Dorgalua decides to turn to darkness. He decides to go to the chaos gate that is in the hanging gardens, open the seal with his royal blood, descend to the abyss to become powerful so he can recover his family. However, as soon as he enters, the Chaos Gate would close soon after, so he tells the plan to his most faithful servant who would be in charge of reopening the gate right away so he could return. This information ends up being overheard by some castle employee and ends up reaching Branton's ears. He then decides to act and hires an assassin to kill Dorgalua's servant. The king goes to the Chaos Gate and with his blood opens the portal and emerges into the abyss. The portal closes soon after and with no one to reopen it, Dorgalua is trapped in the underworld. With the death of the heir to the throne and the queen and the disappearance of the king, the kingdom of Valyria descends into chaos and panic. Bakrams, Galgastani and Wallisters fight again. Branton takes advantage of the situation to use his influence among the backroom and his political power within the Order of Philaha and expels Mruva, becoming the supreme leader of the Order, determining the independence of the North and the creation of the backroom Valyria Kingdom. As the royal family was not available to rule, he finds a distant relative of the queen who was still a child and becomes regent of the kingdom until the child grows up, giving the orders and having all the control. 
Brenton begins to have nightmares in which Dorgalua orders him to be released from his prison. To the south, the Galgastani organize themselves and form the kingdom of Galgastan under the rule of Hierohant, Lunderbal Batos. Bal Batos is also an authoritarian dictator with a thirst for power, so to legitimize his authority he takes the son of the former Count Orlando and becomes regent of the country until the child grows up, just like Branton. Also to the south, the Wallister territories are organized under the regency of Duke, Judah Ramwe, a versatile politician and good strategist who convinces the masses to support him in command. Seeing his brother's lust for power and fearing that he would someday come after Versalia, Prancer decides to flee south with his children. He goes to the city of Galiat, decides to become a Wallister, and changes everyone's family name to that of his wife, Pavel, in order to hide. The two children befriend a boy named Vice Bozek in the area and soon become great friends. The three new centers of power were formed on the island, but seeing the numerical superiority of the kingdom of Galgaston, Branton knew it was a matter of time before they were invaded and dominated, so he made a decision. He contacts the Holy Lodician Empire and proposes a deal. They would help his kingdom with the soldiers of Lodis and in return he talks about the lost daughter of the last king and especially about the power Dorgalua went to obtain in the Abyss. Lodis becomes interested in obtaining this power and entrusts the Dark Knights with this mission in secret. Knowing that it was a sealed Chaos Gate, Commander Lancelot Tartarus decides to go to Zenobia in search of the sword capable of breaking any seal that was one of the sacred treasures of the royal family. He prepares his battalion consisting of Knights of Lodis and the elite Knights Balxafon v. Roms. Volok Winzelf, Martim Numus, Barbus Dodgues, Osmo Glacius, Osmamo Glacius, and Endora's Gaffron for this mission. They reach Zenobia and are eventually discovered, causing a fight between the Dark Knights and King Tristan's Holy Knights. Tartarus loses an eye during the battle, but they managed to steal the sword Brynhild and set out for the Valyrian Islands. King Tristan decides to send his best warriors in search of the sword in secret. Under the exile claim, he sends the knight Lancelot Hamilton along with Canopus Wolf, Warren Omen, Merton Walhorn, and Gildas Burn towards the Valyrian Islands. From Zenobia, another character decides to go to the islands as well. It was Deneb Rove, a witch who was looking for more knowledge and ways to earn money. Not understanding the reason for her brother's exile, Iuria Wolf also travels to the islands to the west seeking explanations. During the trip she is attacked by pirates. About to be captured, a sea witch appears and kills all the bandits. This creature feeds on people's souls, so it decides to possess Ayuria's body and use her beautiful voice to attract even more souls to be devoured, staying in a cave in the south of the island. Hoberum discovers that the Dark Knights have gone to Valyria, and even though he is now blind, he heads towards the island to seek revenge on his brother.
Tartarus and his knights arrive on the islands and provide the necessary reinforcement for the backroom. Brenton decides to use his now enhanced army to invade the south and take control of the entire island, but Tartarus stops him saying they are there under Lodi's orders, not Brenton's. Tartarus informs his subordinates that to open the seal of the Chaos Gate, they would need the blood of the royal family, so they should secretly search for the former king's daughter while on the island. While Brenton's thirst for domination was in check, the same could not be said for Balbatos to the south. He inflates the masses by saying that the Galvestanin were a superior race, and their Wallister neighbors an inferior race that should be subjugated. Balbatos then declares the Blood War in order to cleanse the race from the island, invading with his armies the Wallister territory. Duke Ronway is imprisoned in his castle, several Wallisters are killed and a part of these are sent to concentration camps and forced to work. Some Galvestanin are against Balbatos and his attitudes, but as a dictator he punishes anyone who disagrees with his orders, even if they are from the same kingdom. The kingdom of Galgaston now controls the entire south of the island. With Mruva removed from the order due to Brenton's desire for power, the four daughters of the former Archerius take different positions. Olivia remains in the order. Syria founds the rebel group called the Valyrian Liberation Front along with other defectors, such as her sister Sistina, against the Bakram Valyrian Kingdom and established their secret HQ to the east. The last sister, Sherry, decides to betray her father and her sisters and joins Branton, becoming one of her most loyal warriors. Brenton explains to Tartarus about Dorgalua's daughter and that if he found her brother, he would also find the child. Tartarus sought to find the child to place him on the throne as a puppet of Lodi's, taking ultimate control of the island. They end up receiving information that Prancet is in a city called Galiat to the south. So Tartarus gathers all the Dark Knights and prepares an overnight invasion of the city in secret from the backroom. It is precisely here, in this context, that the game will begin. Eighteen years later, let us cling together. Lancelot Tartarus and the other Dark Knights arrive at Galiad. <coughs> to cover their tracks and their real objective, they decide to kill all the people in town and burn all the houses while searching for Prancet and blaming the rebels of the Valyrian Liberation Front. Civilians are awakened in the midst of the massacre and are exterminated one by one. Danum, Vice, and Kashua, who were nearby, hear the screams of people and the torches burning and run back to the city. On the way, they see Vice's father killed by one of the Dark Knights. They reach Prancet and he tells Danum and Kashua to hide. Prancet is taken away by the Dark Knights and the three friends are left desolate within the devastated city. With no information on Prancet's whereabouts, they consider him dead and decide on a revenge plan against Lancelot and his knights. Prancet would be taken north, where he would be interrogated and tortured to tell the whereabouts of Versalia. A month after the Galiad massacre, Danum, Cashua, and Vice set a trap for when Lancelot shows up again at their house. 
They hear footsteps nearby and decide to attack the invaders. His attack is stopped by Commander Lancelot, but it was not Tartarus, but Lancelot Hamilton and the other Zenobians who had arrived on the island. They decide to put down their weapons and talk, as it was a misunderstanding. The Zenobians lied to the three that they were exiles and were there looking for a job. Danum explains that his people, the Wallisters, were dominated by the Galvestanin and their duke trapped in the castle itself. To seek revenge against the Dark Knights, they would need the Duke's help, so the Zenobians decide to help the three invade the castle and free the Duke as a possible job opportunity. Cashua worries about going to war and losing her brother, who at the time was all she had. Danum says that they need to do this and that he would never leave her. They march towards Almorica and encounter resistance from the Galbistanan army that guarded the castle. The incredible strength of Zenobia's warriors manages to defeat the warriors that were there and finally Duke Ronway was free. Ronway says they need to form a military force to reclaim their land, save their people and defeat the bloodthirsty Balbatos. Wallister resistance is founded with some Wallister warriors. The Zenobians are invited to join the group along with the three heroes. Danum, Vice, and Cashua's first mission would be to head west to find Leonar Ressi Ryman, the Duke's right hand knight, who had been hunting a powerful necromancer along with his group and hadn't sent word since. The Zenobians would stay in the castle to protect from another invasion, so it was up to Ravnus Loxarian, a powerful warrior of the Wallister army, to accompany them. On the way they meet some Galgastanan warriors and Canopus appears to help and join them as he was bored in the castle with the others. Arriving at their proposed destination, they encounter one of Leonar's group members named Don Alto Presence, an exorcist who was facing powerful creatures of darkness and was about to be killed. They help in the battle and manage to emerge victorious. Presence takes them to where Leonar was taking refuge. They had underestimated their enemy and their group was all defeated with the exception of Leonar, Presence and two other warriors, the Knight Voltaire Montrose and the Archer Sarah Ostwald. Denam tells them to return to the Duke but Leonar says he's going to finish off the necromancer first for what he's done. Everyone joins the group and goes after him. They finally find him in the middle of a fortress. The necromancer is called Nibeth Abdelord, a Galvestani obsessed with his quest for immortality and who uses his victims' bodies and souls to conjure creatures of darkness at his command. With Danum's help, Leonar manages to advance against the cursed creatures and attack Nibeth, who transforms into a crow and flees the battlefield to continue her experiments. With that threat temporarily defeated, Danum and Leonar's group return to Almorica and report back to the Duke. Now with his most loyal knight at his side again, Ronway intends to declare war on Balbatos and the Kingdom of Galgaston. But he is concerned that Lodis could interfere in the conflict, which would lead to defeat if it were necessary to fight on two fronts. Ronway then orders Danum and his group to head north along with Leonar to fit a castle where the Knights of Lodis were in order to forge an agreement for them not to interfere in the conflict that would take place in the south between Wallister and Galbistani. 
Denim, Cashua, and Vice are apprehensive of making a deal with those they have sworn revenge on, but decide to follow the Duke's orders for the greater good and they head north. On the way to the castle, they encounter some Galvestanian warriors facing a woman. They save her and she introduces herself as Sistina from the Valyrian Liberation Front. Leonar becomes hostile as it is said on the streets that they are violent rebels. Sistina says this is false as they were only seeking peace and were against Brenton's authoritarian rule. Sistina leaves and they continue their journey. They arrive at the castle and are greeted by the Dark Knight Balxaphon, the second in command. Quickly, Tartarus appears and decides to listen to them. Danum, Cashua, and Vice are enraged, seeing their tormentor in front of them. Tartarus realizes that they were survivors of Goliat and apologizes, saying that the information that there were rebels in the city was false. Leonar speaks on behalf of the Duke and comments on the pact. Tartarus agrees and says that Lodis will be neutral in this conflict. Mission accomplished, the heroes return to Almorica to report. Romway says that Galvestan and troops would soon be organized to invade Elmorica again, so the next mission would be to go to the distant town of Balbamusa, which had been turned into a concentration camp where 5,000 Wallisters were being held under forced labor in order to convince them to rebel and face their captors. That way, Balbatos would need to worry about revolts in his own territory before attacking another territory. Due to the difficulty of the mission, Leonar and Ravnus would accompany Danum and his group as a support. Before leaving, Danum meets with Lance Hamilton and they talk about the terror of being on a battlefield. Lance encourages the boy and Danum sets out to fulfill his mission. On the way, they end up encountering a bandit named Gant Vokstein and his two pet beasts, Berta and Abda. They face each other and Gant runs away at the sight of his opponent's strength. They eventually reach the city of Balbamusa and a violent war is waged against the prison guards. The Wallister resistance emerges victorious from the confrontation and manages to reach the prisoners. Danum tries to convince them to revolt and fight, but the prisoners refuse as they can't take any more violence in their lives. Vice is revolted by the lack of apprehension for freedom and the passivity of preferring to live a prisoner's life than taking up arms and fighting for their people against tyranny. Unsuccessful with the convincing, Leonar calls Danum out of the refuge to talk privately. Leonar explains that the Duke already expected that the prisoners would refuse to revolt, so he had planned a plan B. In order to unite all the Wallisters on the island to take up arms, they should kill all the prisoners on Balbamusa and place the blame on the Galvestanin. That way there would be a social upheaval against Balbatos inside and outside his territory. Danum understands the gravity of the situation and realizes that they wouldn't be victorious against the Galvestani if they didn't get their hands dirty at that moment. So Danum teams up with Leonar to start the massacre. Vice appears and shows the insanity of the plan that would make them equal to the Galvestani themselves to achieve their goals. 
Vice is threatened by Leonor and flees, declaring his rage against his friend Danum and swearing his revenge. Despite not liking the plan, Cashua stands by her brother's side. Ravnus is against the massacre and tries to fight Danum to stop it, but is defeated and flees. Leonor, Danum, and Cashua, along with other knights, carry out the massacre at Balbamusa, claiming the lives of 5,000 Wallister prisoners in the name of the Duke's Rebellion. News of the massacre spreads across the island and the Wallisters manage to regain their territory with the accusation that Balbatos and the Galbistani were behind it. Vice, knowing the truth, spreads word across the island that the massacre was a hoax engineered by Duke Ronway himself. Vice also founds the New Wallister Resistance, an organization for those who want an end to rule by the self-conscious nobles and ruled by the poorest part of society. This organization started to recruit many Wallisters who were against the Duke and his actions. With the accusation of the farce, the Galbistani unite in their territory under the leadership of Balbatos and prepare their armies to invade El Morica. With the final battle between the armies of Balbatos and Ramwe approaching, the Duke orders Leonor to prepare the armies to face the Galbistani directly. Leonor says this is crazy, as the Galbistani are far more numerous and they would be defeated. Ramwe says this would be a distraction, Danum would be sent around the battlefield to Balbamusa, taking the ports in the region, which would prevent the Galbistani from accessing the sea, and then set off to defeat Balbatos, and they would win the battle. Danum and his small group travel to the location, meanwhile the Duke spreads rumors around the island that half of his troops were in Almorica and the other half were in Balbamusa, that way Balbatos would have no way of knowing which of the two fronts would attack him and would be forced to divide his troops, weakening his army. Danum arrives at the scene and defeats some Galbistani warriors while taking control of the ports. These warriors flee to inform Balbatos that it was not a rumor and to ask for reinforcements. Among the Galbistani was Ravnus, who was captured and was going to be sentenced to death. They save the warrior and she says she won't join either side as both the Wallisters and the Galbistani want her dead, so she runs away. Danum also encounters Aracel Dania, an archer from the New Wallister Resistance and one of the only survivors of the Balbamusa massacre, wanting revenge for the death of her family that day. They face each other and close to defeat, Aracel runs away. While Danum was still taking control of the ports, Ronway impulsively orders Leonor to attack Balbatos with his army. Leonor says not to be hasty as they still don't know if the Galbistani had split their troops or not and it could be dangerous. The Duke ignores the warnings and orders the attack anyway. The Wallister and Galbistani armies face each other in a bloody battle for several days, but the Galbistani army still hasn't divided their troops, so they end up winning the battle due to numerical advantage. With many deaths for both sides, each army returns to its territory to recover. This shameful defeat of the Duke's army is reported across the island, causing many Wallister soldiers to disinherit to the new Wallister resistance. 
Danum learns of the defeat and wonders if his work was all in vain, so he decides to take a ship with Kashua to return to Almorica. Kashua says that this war will lead to nothing and tells them to leave the island and live in peace somewhere else, but Danum says that the war is just beginning and Balbatos needs to pay for what he did to the Wallisters. They stop the ship at a fortress that was being overrun by pirates who were about to kill a man. They advance on the warriors and defeat them. The man who was about to be killed is called Zapan Aludas, a mercenary hired by the Duke to fight the Galgastani. With the defeat of the Wallisters on the battlefield, he fled and was captured by the pirates. Zapan asks Danum for a ride to Almorica so he can charge the amount agreed for the service with Romwe. In Almorica, Romwe orders them to advance against Balbatos once more. Leonar says it is a suicidal act, as they lost many men, both to the last battle and also to desertions due to dissatisfaction with the actions taken. Romwe then prepares his new plan. Go to the Las Florian Dark Knights and ask for their help in this war. Leonar is disgusted, as asking for reinforcements would be admitting defeat and becoming vassals of Bakram and Lodis. Romwe gets tired of his knight questioning his plans and sends Leonar away, showing a clear preference for his newest hero and faithful knight, Danum. Danum is then sent to speak with Tartarus and make the deal. Leaving Almorica, Zapan reappears and says that the Duke hired him to stay in the group in exchange for more gold coins, so the mercenary begins to accompany the group. Danum is also informed that the Zenobians were on rhyme and that he was supposed to look for lands when he passed by. Brenton, who was on the royal city of Heim, learns of the weakening of both armies by the battle and decides to take advantage of this situation to invade the south. He calls the Dark Knights Barbus and Martim and orders them to invade the south. Although Tartarus had made a pact with the Duke to maintain neutrality in the conflict, Barbus and Martim ignore their commander's order and decide to advance south alone with their troops not on Brenton's order, but because they heard the Zenobians were there and they wanted a good fight. On the way to Fiddock, Danum encounters some new Wallister resistance warriors who were recruiting soldiers to finish off the bloody Duke and his puppy, Danum. They clash and Danum kills them all. In rhyme, Danum searches for Lance Hamilton, being escorted by some Wallister knights to a house to find him. But who was actually in the house was Leonor, who wanted to talk in private. Leonar says that the Wallisters are doomed because of the Duke's misguided leadership and power-seeking that is causing the nation to collapse from within. Therefore, for the sake of the Wallisters, the Duke should be removed from his position and a new leader should emerge to guide the nation. Leonar says Danum is the perfect person to take on this role. Danum realizes that Leonar was right and that the resistance must win the war at any cost, even if that cost was Romwe's life. Kashua tells his brother that it was madness to use violence and rebel against the one he swore allegiance to and that Danum should accept defeat and leave the island. Danum ignores his sister's advice, willing to do whatever it takes to achieve his goals and heads towards Almorica. On the way out, they run into Aracel again, now accompanied by Vice. The two groups face off fiercely, but are interrupted by the sounds of swords and torches as the Knights of Lodis begin another massacre.
Barbus begins attacking civilians and is soon challenged by Lance Hamilton's sword. Martem's sword is challenged by the Sword of Gildas, who begins to fight the Dark Knight. Merton and Warren, who were also in the city, face Morlody's knights and some Brockham troops trying to advance. While the Siege of Rhyme is taking place, Danum and Vice flee with their groups respectively. Warren is seriously injured and Lance tells them to run away while he holds off the enemies. Warren, Merton, and Gildas retreat and the outnumbered Lance is defeated by Barbus. With no more Zenobians around, Barbus and Martem push back Lodi's troops, leading Lance to be imprisoned in Heim. Denim arrives in Almorica and begins the siege against the Duke's warriors who were protecting the castle. Accused of being a traitor and usurper, Danum and his group face off against several powerful knights and sorcerers. Taking advantage of the confusion, Leonard enters the castle normally, as the troops knew him. Leonard catches up with Ronwe, and the Duke is killed by the sword of his most loyal knight. Danum defeats the warriors and advances to the castle's main hall, where he finds Leonor. Leonor attacks him, knocking Danum to the ground. Leonor wants to kill Danum to put the blame on him for the uprising against the Duke, and so he, Leonor, emerges as the hero who killed the usurper and leads the resistance down the path he thought was right. Kashua shows that Leonar and Ronwe are the same, just power-addicted monsters. As Leonar was about to deliver the killing blow, he is interrupted by the appearance of Vice and Aracel who distract him long enough for Danum to recover. Then begins the battle of the three friends, Danum, Vice, and Kashua against the elite knight, Leonar. After a very difficult fight, miraculously, Dana manages to deliver a fatal blow to Leonar and wins the battle. Leonar says he called the New Wallister Resistance there to join him when he won, but as Dana was the victor, he would now command all the Wallisters. Dana and Vice talk and call a truce to work together on behalf of the nation. News of Duke Ronway's death spreads across the island quickly, which makes both Brantum and Balbatos prepare their next strategies. In rhyme, the Backroom take control of the city and Brantum intends to order an attack on Almorica, but Tartarus says that such an attack would be too unwise as they would be unarmed against the Galgastani. Brantum grows impatient but decides to heed the advice. In the midst of this, the Liberation Front secretly invades Heim and manages to save Prancet, taking him to their headquarters. Barbus and Martin are cursed by Balxaphon for their insubordination in invading Rhyme alone. Tartarus sends the Dark Knights Oz and Ozma to retrieve Prancet and destroy the Liberation Front. In the south, Balbatos decides to take advantage of his enemy's moment of weakness and orders the advance of the remaining majority of his troops to be commanded by the knight Zebos Ronsenbach for an all-out attack against Almorica. Danum prepares a plan to try to win the war. 
He orders Vice and the rest of the troops to advance against the Galvestani troops, and he and his group would take advantage of the unprotected Balbatos from behind and circle the island by ship, advancing through Brigantes to Coritania. Cashua tells Danum to back off, as it was too risky a plan. Danum loses patience with his sister and tells her not to accompany him if he thought it was too dangerous. Cashua is extremely sad and disappointed with Danum and decides to leave the group, returning to their homeland, Galiat, alone. As Danum and Vice head towards their objectives, Oz and Ozma arrive at the fort where the Liberation Front was hidden and start a massacre. The entire Liberation Front is killed by the brothers, Prancid is taken back to the island as ordered, and Saria, the leader of the Liberation Front, is sexually abused by Knights of Lodis, never to be seen again. Tartarus tortures Prancid with poison to discover the princess's whereabouts. Prancid relents and tells him that Cashua is Versalia, the bastard daughter of King Dorgalua, and that this could be seen in the necklace she wore, a gift from the king to his wife if the child she had was a girl. Tartarus decides to return to Galiat in search of her. Danum arrives at Brigantes Castle and fights the troops led by the Honorable Knight, Hector Didaro. Hector and the residents of Brigantes were against Balbato's attitudes, so upon seeing Danum's troops, Hector does not warn Coratania of the attack, but fights to the death with Danum to see if he was a worthy man with values. Hector is defeated and Danum explains to the Galbistani who live there that his fight is against power-hungry men, like the Duke and Balbatos, and not against people, like the Galbistani. This makes one of the prisoners who was in the castle for having revolted against Balbatos decide to follow him. His name is Junin Avertif, a mighty knight. With the victory at Brigantes, Danum heads towards Coritania. Meanwhile, Galvestani troops led by Zebos defeat the Wallisters led by Vice and take control of Almorica. Vice is tortured to tell Danum's whereabouts. The troops in Coritania are surprised by Danum's army advancing through the castle with great force. With the warriors in the castle defeated, Danum catches up with Balbatos and demands his surrender so he can be arrested. Balbatos is very proud and says he will never surrender or degrade himself to one of the scum Wallister, so he uses a knife and takes his own life. With the death of Balbatos, the Galvestani of the region surrender, and those who were against his rule join Danum's army. Danum is informed of Vice's defeat and the loss of Almorica, and marches his troops towards the castle. On the way, he finds Ravnus being chased again. Ravnus is saved and realizes that Danum is no longer an obedient servant of the Duke and has changed his way of thinking and acting. Ravnus joins the group to help create peace between Wallister and Galbistani. Danum continues and is intercepted on the way again by Gant and his two beasts. Being unable to face the protagonist again, Gant flees again. In Galiat, Cashua is sad to be alone. At that moment, Tartarus finds her and tells her that she has always been alone, as she is the last daughter of King Dorgalua. Cashua doesn't believe it, but the knight tells her to look at the necklace she was wearing, which contained the phrases that proved it. 
She is Versalia, the rightful heir to the kingdom of Valyria. Tartarus tells her to go to Heim with him, because there, Prancid could explain everything. Tartarus uses his manipulation to convince Cashua to ally with the Dark Knights and they head north together. Danum arrives in Almorica and faces Zebos and his knights, who refuse to surrender. Zebos is defeated and killed, marking the end of the kingdom of Galgaston. Vice is found inside the castle and is free, joining the group. In Almorica, Danum also finds Murden, Gildas, and Warren recovering from the Battle of Rhine. The two White Knights join Danum's group while Warren is still recovering from his wounds. Danum decides to finally invade Fittic Castle and attack the Dark Knights, but for that he would need to recover Rhyme, who was in command of the backroom. Vice says that a direct attack would be too risky, but that he knew of a secret passage west through the mountains that they could reach the city without being noticed. They follow Vice's plan and get to Rhyme unnoticed. In Rhyme, Ozma was walking around town and meets a blind guy very similar to her fiancé. She tries to capture him, but Danum appears and confronts the warrior, causing her to retreat. Ozma runs away and is confused, as Balxaphon had said that her fiancé had died in Lodi's. She decides to go after Balxaphon to find out the whole truth. The blind man thanks Danum for his help and introduces himself as Hogarim Van Dam, saying he was seeking revenge against the Dark Knights. He joins the group because they have this goal in common. Ozma arrives in Fittick and asks to speak with Balxaphon, but they are interrupted by the sounds of battle taking place at the castle's entrance. Danum's troops were advancing against the backroom knights who guarded the place. Balxaphon orders Ozma to flee with Tartarus and Cashua while he and Oz take care of the invaders. Ozma, who was holding Prancid hostage, seeing his critical health due to torture, decides to release him out of the castle. Prancid wanders lost in the region until he is found by Olivia, one of his friend Ruva's daughters. Olivia hides Prancid and takes him west to tend to his health. Danum steps forward and finds his sister Cashua, but Cashua attacks him, showing that she is now on the side of the Los Lorian Dark Knights. She flees along with Tartarus and Ozma to Heim while Danum faces Oz and Balxaphon in the castle hall. Danum faces the powerful skill of Oz while Hogarim finally faces his brother Balxaphon. but the determination of Danum and his allies is able to overcome the skill of the two Dark Knights. Oz is killed in the confrontation and Balxaphon, seeing that he was outnumbered, retreats and flees. Fiddick was now under the control of the Wallister resistance. In Heim, Tartarus spreads the news to the entire island that the lost daughter of King Dorgalua has been found, the true heir to the throne of Valyria, and that Lodi supported her as governess. This information shook all the civilians who wanted peace and the unification of the island under a legitimate ruler with royal blood. Even the warriors of the Wallister resistance were wary of taking up arms against the true heir. A ceremony is held at Hyle to commemorate the princess' return, with Brantum and King Dorgalua's former soldiers offering loyalty and Tartarus, representing Pope Sardian and the Holy Laudition Empire, 
reaffirming the alliance between the two nations. Tartarus visits the prison where Lands was being tortured and the two discuss their views on the war. Tartarus believes that people cry out for someone to rule them because they are incapable of doing anything and just play victims. Hamilton, on the other hand, had faith in humanity and in the freedom of people to do the right thing. Tartarus walks away and leaves the knight who took his eye on Zenobia alone. To face the warriors of the south, Branton decides to go after the forbidden magic apocrypha that King Roderick Dismoria had used in the war against Dorgalua and had been sealed by Mruva Foina. He decides to send Mruva's own daughter, Sherry, who had betrayed her family, in search of her own father. With the appearance of the princess, some warriors who were devotees of the Order of Philaha revolt against the resistance and take control of Brigantes, taking hostages. Danum decides to go there to talk to them. To prove that he didn't want to fight and saw peace, Danum arrives at the castle without his army and totally unarmed, which gives confidence to the rebels who don't attack him. Danum is then greeted by Olivia, who was commanding the rebels, and says that Prancet, his father, was in the castle. Danum is surprised he is alive and rushes to find him. Prancet was extremely weakened from the poison used in the torture, so he tells Danum the whole story of Cashua and how she was Dorgalua's daughter, Versalia. Prancet says that Lodis was there seeking Dorgalua's power, and as they now had his daughter, they would go after the king's tomb to get his power. He tells him to find Mruva, the order's former superior, who would help him. In his last breath of life, Prancet tells Danum to save his sister and lead Valeria to the right path. Danum sees his father dying in his arms shortly afterwards. After that moment, Olivia asks if Danum doesn't remember her. Olivia reveals that she and her three other sisters played with Danum and Cashua when they were children and lived in Heim. Olivia reveals that Danum is not a Wallister, but a backroom. Her real name was Danum Warren and Brenton, the ruler of the backroom, was her uncle. Olivia indicate where Mruva, her father, could be. Olivia joins the group and they head towards their destination. Ozma confronts Balxafon with the rest of the Dark Knights. Balxafon tells the truth that Hogarim was secretly exiled so as not to harm the institution's name, and the entire event of his death was a cover. Ozma is disgusted by the lies that all the Dark Knights, even her brother Oz, had told her and leaves after her fiancé. Tartarus tries to stop her but fails, so he sends Volok after her. Danum arrive at the location indicated and find Ruva surrounded by backroom troops, with Sherry in the lead and asking where the Apocrypha is. Olivia tries to convince her sister to give up, but Sherry commands her warriors to face Danum. The protagonist's group defeats all the warriors and Sherry, alone, retreats and flees. 
Denim asks Ruva for help in ending all wars, uniting the entire island back into one nation, just as Dorgaliua did in the past. Ruva agrees to help, and with that the Order of Philaha allies and supports the resistance. Danum is informed that mercenaries have a hostage nearby, so he decides to go there to help while Ruva goes to Fiddock. They face the mercenaries and manage to free the warrior named Ocean Rabin. Ocean had her village totally destroyed by Balbatos when he attacked his enemies. The knight who led this attack was Junin, who was in Danum's group. Junin asks Ocean for forgiveness and says she can take his life if she wants to. Ocean is reluctant to accept the apology, but Danum says that Junin's remorse was sincere and that she should keep an eye on him. Ocean joins the group to monitor Danum's next steps. In the midst of the battle, they notice a figure hiding in one of the houses. It was Sherry, who was devastated that she had been unable to carry out her orders. Danum says his goal is just to bring peace to the island, and Olivia manages to convince her to join the resistance. To prepare for the invasion of Heim and confront Brenton and Tartarus, Danum looks for a way to raise funds for the war and his army. His informants comment on an alleged treasure hidden by pirates on an island to the south, and he decides to head there to find it. The informant warns to be careful as there are reports of people disappearing there due to a witch taking them to the depths. On the way there, they find Osman being ambushed by Volok and his knights. Osma asks if the guy Danum was with was actually Hobirim. Hobirim responds by saying yes, that everyone lied to her about her whereabouts and that Tartarus and Balxaphon were traitors for using the Pope to achieve their goals in Lodis. Danum and Hobirim confront Volok and his knights, winning the confrontation and causing them to retreat. Hobirim tells Ozma the whole truth and tells her to join him and help bring peace to the island and later to Lodi's. Ozma joins the group, becoming her fiancé's eyes, as he becomes the one who would show the way. Danum and his group head to Port Omish, a neutral region where bandits and pirates used to stay and which was now also home to main island civilians and refugees fleeing the war. Among these people, a person with wings sang and admired everyone with his voice. Canopus soon recognizes her. It was her sister, Ayuria Wolf. Surprised with her being there, he tries to get her attention, but when noticed, Ayuria flees towards the caves. In town, they meet Diego Gaila de Zelston, the famous and feared pirate who people say was the only one able to reach the depths of the pirate graveyard and come back alive. Diego had left behind his life of pillaging as soon as his daughter died in battle during the war and this led to a life of frustration and drinking. Danum convinces him to join the rebels to end the war once and for all. Diego accepts and guides them inside the pirate graveyard. Inside, they are reunited with Ayuria, who reveals herself to be a sea witch who had possessed Canopus sister's body and would steal their souls as well. Danum confronts the witch and manages to defeat her, expelling her from her body and bringing the real Ayuria back. 
Ayuria explains that she was there looking for her brother after learning of the exile and that the witch had saved her from pirates during the trip. Ayuria joins the group and they continue deeper into the caves, where they eventually find the said treasure of legends. Now with the necessary funds for the war, they return and head to Fiddick to prepare the attack to the north. Hearing the sound of many gold coins that were now with the group, the Zenobian Deneb Rove appears and offers its powerful and exclusive equipment for sale to the resistance. Knowing that the battle against Brenton and the Dark Knights would be very difficult, Danum decides to spend a large amount on equipment and weapons. Deneb's magical servants who helped at the shop see all the wealth and revolt at not being paid for their work, starting a revolution. Danum helps Deneb negotiate a deal for them to run the store and receive a share of the profits in return, pacifying the situation. Deneb joins Danan's group to seek out more artifacts and knowledge while her servants work in the shop in her place. On the way to Fiddock, they pass Almorica and Danum finds that Warren has improved a little and is awake. He asks the Astromancer the real reason the Zenobians were on the island, if it was to dominate just like Lodi's. Warren explains that they were after the Brynhilde sword that had been stolen from Zenobia by the Dark Knights, as this sword was very dangerous in the wrong hands as it could break any seal, including those in Chaos Gates. Deneb says hi to his companion in Zenobia and wishes him a speedy recovery. Danum hurries up and heads for Fiddock. On Fiddock, the Resistance prepares their army to march on Heim, but Danum is informed by one of the spies that Cashua has been seen heading north to Barnisha along with Tartarus. Danum then decides to send some troops towards Heim as a distraction to the backroom while he and his group headed towards Barnisha. On the way to Barnisha, the Dark Knight Endoras appears and stands in the way. The two armies clash, and seeing defeat imminent, Endoras retreats and flees. At the gates of Barnisha, they are met by the Dark Knight Barbus and his Knights of Lodis, causing a conflict with many casualties on each side, but with victory tending towards resistance. Barbus withdraws from the battle and flees. Inside the castle, Tartarus orders Cashua to flee to Heim, but she refuses, saying she can't take any more wars and fights and goes into hiding. Tartarus tries to go after her, but at that moment Danum and his army appear in the main hall of the castle. Tartarus and Danum face off while the other warriors in the group battle the Lodi soldiers accompanying the commander. The fight goes on for a long time due to the Death Templar's extreme strength and skill, but seeing that he was outnumbered, Tartarus retreats and flees. Inside the castle, Danum finds Cashua sad and scared in one of the rooms. Cashua says that she was very disappointed to have been abandoned by Danum and that she couldn't take the whole situation anymore. Danum says he never abandoned her, neither he nor Prancet, and that a family is much more than just blood. These words make Cashua open her eyes and rekindle the love and affection she had for her family. Cashua asks for forgiveness for being selfish and leaving. Danum and Cashua make up again and return to Fiddick together.
Kashua decides to assume her role as princess and heir to the throne and says that she will go on the front lines along with Danum, commanding the troops to end the war and bring peace. Now with the princess on the side of the resistance, soldiers are motivated to move forward under her banner. Kashua sends three messengers to Brenton and Heim asking for his surrender, but receives no return. Danum and Kashua then prepare their armies and they march towards Heim. Resistance armies and backroom armies clash on the battlefield on multiple fronts for several days. Danum receives information that a ship that was passing near the Valyrian Islands ended up sinking nearby and the survivors were being attacked. Danum goes there to help and finds the Dark Knight Martin preparing to kill the last survivor, the Fusilier Jonathan Torjo's Lindel. Martim is relentless and with his powerful blows takes the lives of many soldiers in Danum's group before retreating and fleeing. Jonathan joins the group in gratitude for Danum saving his life. After this dramatic battle against Martim, Danum realizes that taking on the Dark Knights would not be an easy task and he would need all the help he could get to even the odds. He decides to return to talk to Mruva about the Apocrypha spell Sherry had mentioned earlier. On the way, he encounters Gamp and his two beasts again, initiating another clash. Gamp is defeated for the third time and asks Danum to take his life but spare the lives of his two pets. Danum notices Gamp's good heart and invites him to join the group to use his talents for good. Gamp, Berta, and Abda begin to be part of the resistance at this time. On Fiduk, Ruva is reluctant to give information about the forbidden knowledge, given the tragedy that happened when King Roderick Dismoria used it in battle. But seeing Danum's good intentions and attitudes, he decides to help and points out the locations where they were sealed, along with the secret that only his daughters were able to break the seal and achieve the power. Danum then sends Sherry and Olivia to each of the shrines to obtain the power for the resistance. The two sisters face some pirates who were stationed in each of the shrines and are successful in getting the powers. Danum and Kashua, now with access to Apocrypha spells, are confident and begin the final march to Heim. In Heim, Brenton and Tartarus argue around the other Dark Knights. Tartarus says he will return to Lodi's because Brenton was already doomed from the beginning for refusing to follow his orders not to invade and now for not returning command of the kingdom to the crown princess as the population wanted. At that moment, Barbus, Martim and Andorra's rebel and point their weapons at Tartarus, Balxaphon and Valet, trapping them in a room. Martim takes the Brynhild sword that was with them and accuses Tartarus of wanting Dorgalua's power just for himself, making up this story that he would need the princess and not going directly to the Chaos Gate as Lodi's orders. Barbus, Martim, and Andorus head towards the Hanging Gardens to get the power for them. Tartarus, Balxaphon, and Volok manage to break free from prison and flee the castle just as Danum and Kashua's troops arrive in Heim. Kashua orders Branton to surrender and leave the regency, but he refuses and commands his knights to face them. Danum defeats his uncle, thus ending the Bakram Valerian kingdom.
Not having time to celebrate, they are informed that the Dark Knights are heading to the Hanging Gardens. Denim remembers his father's words and decides to stop them from reaching Dorgalua's power. While still in Heim, they discover a man trapped in the dungeon. It was Lance Hamilton, the Zenobia Knight who had been tortured to the point of being catatonic and memoryless due to the trauma. Hamilton is left in care as they make their way to the gardens. Within the many floors of the abandoned gardens, Danum encounters many creatures and beasts. He advances and finds Andoras and her knights guarding the path leading to the Chaos Gate. They engage in combat and Andoras is defeated and killed. Danum and his group rushed towards the chamber, but it was too late. Barbus had already used the sword Brynhild to break the seal on the gate. They face each other as the chaos gate starts to activate. Barbus and Martim are finally defeated and killed. Danum takes the legendary sword and at that moment, coming from the abyss, King Dorgalua Abarith appears, completely corrupted by darkness, transformed into an ogre due to all the time he spent in the underworld. Driven by hatred, Dorgalua says that he will return to reign over the island that is rightfully his and kill all his opponents. The former king uses his newfound powers of the abyss to create cursed clones of all the warriors in Danum's group, sparking a fierce battle between them. Danum manages to organize his army to face the creatures, leaving an opening for Kashua to deliver the killing blow to the Dorgalua. The king recognizes Kashua as his own blood and comes to his senses for a brief moment. The evil god of the underworld Demunza then uses his powers to further corrupt Dorgalua in order to bring on another ogre battle and rule the world. Dorgalua transforms into a gigantic creature and starts attacking the protagonists. With the union of the entire army, they manage to injure the beast and Danum manages to deliver the deadly attack on the creature. The creature rises, slamming into the walls and destroying the pillars of the room as it disintegrates and is pulled back into the abyss. The room starts to collapse and the chaos gate starts pulling everyone into the underworld. At that moment Warren appears still weakened and uses the rest of his powers to teleport everyone out of the hanging gardens. With no more energy, Warren is drawn into the Chaos Gate, which is destroyed shortly after by the room collapsing. <laughs> Epilogue With the defeat of Branton and the Dark Knights Los Lorian, preparations begin for the coronation of Kashua as Queen Versalia, uniting all Valyria again under her command as the rightful heir of the former king. In the meantime, she orders that much of the treasury's resources be used to treat and develop medicines for those wounded in the war, such as those who have lost limbs or suffered psychological trauma while the kingdom rebuilds itself. Danum finds Merton, Gildas, and Canopus in Heim and gives them the Brynhild sword to take back to their homeland.
but they say they're going in search of Warren. Danum is confused, but they explain that before they came to the island, a great sage had prophesied that the five of them would return to Zenobia alive. Warren was probably inside the Chaos Gate and must have been waiting on the other side for someone to free him. So, they would go to another place that might have a Chaos Gate in search of him. Danum is grateful that Warren saved his life in the Hanging Gardens and decides to go along with them on this adventure. Danum's group reassembles and they march towards what would be the best guess, the mysterious Palace of the Dead. The Palace of the Dead is a real labyrinth with an unknown amount of floors, traps, and secret passages. Built by the creatures of darkness for the creatures of darkness, the living who dared to venture there were never seen again. They advanced through the first floors and walls with the sound of death itself accompanying them. Soon they are surprised by evil creatures and bloodthirsty beasts never seen before. No one was prepared for the horrors that the place contained. Many warriors in Danum's group are wounded in the countless battles with the beasts and beings of the abyss that attack them, but with determination they continue to advance, floor by floor. On one of these floors, they find some Galbistani warriors who saw power and secrets hidden in the palace to take revenge and rebuild the kingdom of Galgaston. They are all defeated and the creatures of darkness claim their souls. On another floor, a man was being attacked by dark creatures and evil dragons. Danum comes to his aid and manages to defeat these creatures before they attack. The boy thanks the help and introduces himself as Robert Rudlum, saying he's there researching draconic magic. He proposes to help the group as he continues his research and they head into the depths together. Robert Rudlum is actually a disguise. He is actually Albilio, a mage on the run from the sacred Zydeginian Empire with the power of resurrection who fought the Zenobians during the revolution that ended in the Empire's fall. He was defeated on occasion and disappeared. His quest for power has led him to Valyria and now to this unlikely union with Danum's group. A few more floors below, more and more deadly creatures emerged and faced the heroes. In a dark hall, Danum and his group are reunited with the necromancer Nibeth who was in the palace doing his research for immortality. Nibeth uses her newfound powers and summons creatures from the palace to face the warriors. Danum defeats the reanimated bodies and mortally strikes Nibeth. But that was exactly what Nibeth wanted. He discovered in his research that that room had a different energy, and through a cursed ring, Nibeth performs a ritual and becomes a lich, an immortal being no longer bound by physical mortality because he had abdicated his flesh, reanimating his body and merging with his soul. Nibeth is satisfied that he has finally achieved his research goal and flees to the depths of the palace to seek more power. Continuing the journey through the dark corridors, some more floors and creatures are overcome. They find a human-looking being who lived in the palace, searching for powers and objects that the place contained. Her name was Beelzebuth, and she shares some of her discoveries and secrets with Danum, thinking he was a dark researcher as well. 
Danum shows denial of the Abyss's temptations, which makes Beelzebuth show himself to be a monster that possesses people and attack him to steal his body. Danum wins and successfully kills the creature. And deeper we go. In a ritual room, they again meet the now lich Nibeth for one last duel. Nibeth's body is defeated and her soul becomes one with the darkness of the abyss. With Nibeth's death, Blackmoor, the guardian of the Palace of the Dead, appears to face and expel Danum and his warriors for violating the territory of the evil creatures. About to be defeated by the mighty guardian, Danum in despair uses the divine power of the Brynhildr sword to attack the mighty opponent, who disappears in a burst of light. With Blackmoor defeated, a secret passage opens up in front of them, which would lead them towards the abyss itself. They advance and finally reach the chaos gate that was on the deepest floor of the tower. Danum hears a voice asking to release him. Imagining it to be Warren, he uses the Brynhildr to break the seal and opens the gate. At this moment, Warren emerges from the darkness, badly injured. Danum and the Zenobians are happy to be reunited with their former ally, but Warren says they made a mistake, as he wasn't the only one trapped there. At this moment, King Roderick Desmoria appears, he who had his soul consumed by the abyss and has now turned into a mighty ogre just like Dorgalua, seeking revenge on all those who condemned him. They face the powerful enemy with Warren's help, and with great luck defeat him, causing the king's soul to be completely destroyed. Warren uses the rest of his powers to seal the Chaos Gate forever and they march back to the surface together. The group returns to Heim and receives another great news. A remedy that was developed by the funds earmarked by the princess proved successful in improving and recovering Lance Hamilton's psychological state. Dana meets up with the former knight who has now almost recovered and thanks him for all the help. With Coronation Day approaching, the Zenobians form a pact of support between the two nations and say goodbye to return to Zenobia. Lands invites Danum to visit his homeland as soon as possible, as there are many things for him to see and learn. Lancelot Hamilton, Warren, Canopus, Merdin, Gildas, and Ayuria take the ship to Zenobia. Deneb, seeing the end of the war is not good for his business, hitches a ride with them to the east. Meanwhile, to the north, the three surviving Lothlorien Dark Knights, Tartarus, Balsafon, and Volok, hide inside a ship that was heading towards Lodis and escape undiscovered. The coronation ceremony takes place. Queen Versalia Aberth unifies the nation again under her command with the complete acceptance of the island's population, bringing peace to Valyria once more. Some time later, Danum is happy to have fulfilled the promise he made to his father and decides to go to Zenobia for two reasons. First, to fulfill the promise he made to Lands. And second, not to get in the way of Cashua's government, as some people on the island wouldn't forgive him after so many lives he had to take in the war. This could cause even more conflict and his home deserved peace. 
Cashua builds a monument in Galiat in memory of those who died in the massacre to remind everyone how these precious lives brought the people together and the liberation of Valyria. Her kingdom will be one of peace for a long time, until the time when Lodis decides to strike again. This is the end of the story of the game Tactics Ogre, let us cling together. What did you think of this game when you first played it? Are you ready for Reborn? Write in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, give a like and subscribe to the channel, it helps us a lot here on YouTube. Thank you all and see you soon with more videos from the Ogre Battle Saga.